What if we prioritized rest? Today's preacher, the Reverend Karen Fraser Gitlitz says, when I think about prioritizing rest, my head fills with voices, parents, mentors, even past employers, and I notice a strong reaction in my body. To help us understand what is happening and why rest is so significant, we will lean into the writings of Black authors and activists, such as Trisha Hershey, who have identified the theological necessity of rest for individuals and communities. As we begin, we pause to remember that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality, and continues to do so, which provides a rich and fertile context for us as we gather in religious community here in Westwood. For this, we are grateful. And as people who are a part of Treaty 6, we commit ourselves to the creation of an equitable, just, and compassionate relationship throughout our shared territory. Welcome to Westwood. My name is Rebecca Patterson, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. I am your service leader today. Our speaker this morning is the Reverend Karen Fraser Gitlitz. Our musician is Carrie Day. Welcome back. And our tech team consists of Hannah and Brandon Iscaaro at the back, and Bill Lee, our online host uh, for Zoom, and the one who records and posts our services to YouTube each week. David is working on coffee and tea, or he's here now, and uh, he would appreciate a hand with cleaning up afterwards. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all visitors and newcomers, whether you're here in person or online. You may find people of many persuasions among us Unitarian Universalists, Buddhists, humanists, pagans, Christians, atheists, and a healthy sprinkling of agnostics. You may find people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. You will find vegetarians, feminists, environmentalists, activists. 
Chances are, with a few exceptions, you name it, we've got it. However, what our whatever our stance or spiritual path, we affirm the seven principles that you can see on the posters on our walls. We search for truth everywhere, but some of our name sources include the teachings of earth-based religions, words and deeds of prophetic people, and wisdom from the world's religions. However, the first and foremost most source is our own direct experience. Each of us is our own authority. This service today is part of the Meaning Making series. We are part of a group of 10 Canadian Universal, Unitarian Universalist congregations who are sharing resources to create an eight part series on the roots of resilience. This service on intentional rest is the first in the series. Jen Pollock and Bill Lee will now lead us in our opening words. Could you please wait, Jen and Bill, until we have you? Oh, we already do have you on the screen. There we are. OK, please go ahead, Jen. Our chalice lighting words are by Sherry Woodbury. Please respond to each statement with come in, be among us. To all who are yearning for community. Come in. Be among us. To all who are just getting started, to all who long to go deeper, to all with tender places needing care. Come in, be among us. To the ones who have healed and have care to give, for those who are curious and hungry to learn, for those who know that they have something to teach. Come in. Be among us. For the ones who are just beginning to suspect they might nurture others becoming. To the young and the old, the innocent and the jaded, the fresh of mind and the deeply steeped, there is room here for each and every one. Come in. Be, be among, among us. us. Thank you. Please join in singing song number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath. Carrie's going to play the whole tune for us once, and then please rise in body or in spirit. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on our week. We recall the milestones, the joys, concerns, and sorrows, the changes in our lives, those who need our healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. 
I invite you now to light candles of concern or celebration. When uh, David was speaking and uh, also when Etta was talking about birthdays, I realized I neglected last week <clears throat> to ask the, um, the pianist to play happy birthday. I think, yeah. So um, I would like to say we should sing happy birthday to uh, September Westwoodians. Yeah. Do we have any in the room? Oh, we can do it a cappella. Yeah, we can do it a cappella. Right. That would be that would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear September West Woodians. Happy birthday to you. Oh my, we have some. <laughs> we have lots of uh, <laughs> harmony going on. All right. I will light one more candle for any joys and concerns that remain in our hearts. And would you, would you please join me in the affirmation? May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power. To help and not to hinder. To serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Our offerings of money and volunteer service are the essential elements that sustain our congregation and this place of worship. Some donate on Sundays, others on a monthly basis. Um, please be aware that if you're donating cash today and would like a tax receipt, we ask that you use an envelope so our church administrator can issue a tax receipt. Um, there are envelopes in the pockets of the chairs behind you or in front of you, I guess in front of you. Um, you can also donate online by following the directions on the slide there. So let's sing from you I receive. And now we're going to sing again, song 352, Find a Stillness. Again, Carrie's going to play it through for us.
Karen Fraser Gitlitz is a Unitarian Universalist minister and a professional art therapist. Karen and her partner Paul recently relocated to the Saanich Peninsula on southern Vancouver Island. Karen continues to serve small U Canadian UU congregations through the Meaning Making Project while deepening her exploration of the intersection between spirituality, the arts, and social justice. Our first reading is by Maria Popova, the Bulgarian author of the Marginalian blog and email newsletter. Popova writes, Few things limit us more profoundly than our own beliefs about what we deserve. And few things liberate us more powerfully than daring to broaden our locus of possibility and self-permission for happiness. The stories we tell ourselves about what we are worthy or unworthy of are the stories that shape our lives. Are you a nap person? I have to admit, I am not. When the word rest began popping up on social media a few years ago, followed by articles and then books, I did not rush to find out more. Perhaps this is because I was overtired for a long stretch of my adult life. It started in grad school and I just got used to it. Maybe underneath my no napping personality was a fear that if I lay down and slept, I might not get up for a long time. Perhaps it was voices from childhood and teenage years, people who cared that I had a strong work ethic, that I wasn't afraid of hard work, as the saying goes. Whatever the reason, I viewed rest with a sense of ambivalence. But just at the time, as I started looking around and thinking, I'm not really sure that the way I do work is good for me, my life took a sideways turn and I got a concussion that didn't heal well. As an aside on concussions, the majority of people with a concussion heal fully within a couple of weeks. But if you pass the six week mark, just waiting for your brain to heal won't work. You need to do something about it. One of the things that I learned over the course of my recovery was that my approach to learning wasn't well aligned with how my brain wanted to work. Up until then, I always thought of myself as a good learner, but my go-to strategies were not working well. However, when I did what the vision therapist suggested and did things to help myself relax, listening to music, changing my breathing pattern, the difference in how my brain responded to the challenges was unmistakable. I was so much more successful. My brain likes rest and works best when I am relaxed, whether I think it should be this way or not. The rest didn't need to be long to be effective. Even a couple of minutes resulted in a marked change in my ability to respond. Like anything else, practice helped. Pause and take a breath. And then return to the work. Lie down, listen to one song, and then return to the work. Walk outside, feel the grass under my bare feet, and then come back in. What I was learning about how to challenge my brain fit in with what I was also learning about sleep. Sleeping well can be a huge challenge when you're dealing with post-concussion symptoms. What you need can be incredibly elusive. Initially, I had to piece together things on my own, but more recently, I came across the work of Stan Rodsky. For a long time, people have put emphasis on how you get ready for bed, the room you sleep in, getting up at a regular time, et cetera, et cetera, and these are all important. But what was missing for me, what Rodsky clarified, is that it matters how we handle our stresses throughout the day. This also affects our sleep. Rodsky invites us to take little mini brain breaks several times a day. It only takes five to seven minutes to change our brain state. And this has a huge influence on how we handle stress and our ability to focus and be creative. For those who are part of the meaning making project and have the theme packet that goes with this month's theme of intentional rest, there is a link in the packet to Rodsky's work. Now, being post-concussion, my brain was unusually sensitive and less able to regulate than that of a normal adult. 
You may never have a concussion that doesn't heal well. I sincerely hope you don't. But I do think that many of us, in ways small and large, are affected by being overtired. We may think we're handling things well, but are we actually fully present in the moment? Are we even half present? As I recovered from this concussion, the temptation to slip back into old habits was pretty strong. I would schedule my day, and because my brain was working well enough, I'd get through the day and maybe the next, but then I would have challenges sleeping, which would affect the following day. No longer getting the headaches that told me I needed to rest, thank goodness. I realized I needed to bring more intention into how I was living my life. There are so many fun and interesting ways to take a brain break. I would set an alarm, but then the alarm would go, and then I would say, oh, I'll just finish this email, and then it was forgotten. We have to give rest sufficient weight, or it will always come in a distant second. Enter Trisha Hersey, founder of the NAP Ministry, with her cultural analysis and insistence that rest is a necessary form of resistance, a counter narrative to the dominant story. Our second reading this morning is from Hersey's book, Rest is Resistance, a Manifesto. Hersey says, Rest is not popular, supported, or modeled in this culture. It is an outlier movement until capitalism and white supremacy are dismantled. Therefore, we cannot wait until we're told it's okay to rest. No one will tell you this. You will have to make space for yourself and others around you to rest. Resting is not a state of inactivity. It is, in its, it is the body in a generative space. When you are resting your body, it is in its most connected space, state, sorry. Your organs are regenerating. Your brain is processing new information. You are connecting with a spiritual practice. You are honoring your body. You are being present. All these things are so foundational for liberation and healing to take root. Your bodies don't belong to capitalism, to white supremacy, or to the patriarchy. Your body is a divine temple and a place of generative imagination, a place of healing and freedom. End of reading. Many times in the book, Hersey uses the image of unraveling to describe rest. The unraveling of the urgent and anxious, the unspooling of tension. What sets this unraveling in motion? For me, gaining an understanding of the cultural and political forces that contribute to exhaustion helps me move from idea to action. Hersey is a Black woman living in the United States. She is unapologetically writing for her people. This is important context. There is a reason why the rest movement is so big in Black circles, especially among Black women and genderqueer folk. These are people whose lives and labor were stolen and then after emancipation, who continued to be exploited, underpaid, and undervalued. Who continue to be exploited, underpaid, and undervalued. Hersey offers us a glimpse of her rest muse, her grandmother, Aura, a woman who left the Jim Crow South to raise eight children while working two jobs. In the midst of everything that was going on in her life and in her house, Aura rested her eyes for 30 minutes every day. As a young child, Hersey was fascinated. What are you doing? I'm resting my eyes, her grandmother said. Or sometimes she would say, I'm listening to God. Or just, I'm listening. 30 minutes a day of being, not doing. As a theologian, Hersey believes that our bodies are not just machines for doing. We are beings. We are meant to be. Being is our birthright. Fundamental to Black theology is the question of worth and the worthiness of people who are told literally and metaphorically that they are not worthy or not as worthy as others. Percy says to our people, her people, you are worthy of rest. You deserve space and time for dreaming. 
You do not have to keep working to find your sense of worth. Regardless of our social location, our gender, race, ethnicity, skin color, sexuality, these words should be sparking something for us as Canadian Unitarian Universalists. This is our first principle, the commitment to worth and dignity. This is what lies behind Emily Stowe's championing of medical care for women. Lada Hitchmanova's call to help the children of Europe after the Second World War, and our vote to create an eighth principle, calling us to dismantle racism and other forms of oppression. One of the most moving experiences of my parish ministry career was watching the conversation unfold around the eighth principle in the congregation that I was then serving. There were many questions and wonderings, but when it came time for the talking circle before the congregational vote, I heard several variations of this. I'm not sure I understand why we need this, or I'm not sure I like the wording, but I hear that you need it. And this statement is central to your sense of worth in this community, and I will vote for it or not block it for this reason because your sense of worth matters to me. That, my friends, is Unitarian Universalism in action, putting the inherent worth and dignity of every person in the center, leaving no one behind, as Hersey says. Yes, the history in Canada is different than that in the United States, but worth is an issue for us too. Worth has a history of being gendered and racialized here too. Slavery might have been abolished in 1834, but poor working conditions, discrimination, and limited opportunities remained, exhaustion remained, and remains. Even a quick peek into Canadian labor and immigration history brings up policies based on the relative value of different races. One early example is the servant girl problem, as it was called in the 1870s, all the way through to the 1930s. Middle and upper middle class wives wanted domestic servants, preferably young women born in Canada, by which they meant white, English speaking Protestant girls. But these so called young Canadian women preferred factory or clerical work, even though it paid less, because it provided them with independence. All of their evenings were free, not just one or two nights a week. Various attempts were made to make the work more desirable, the work of a domestic more desirable. But still, the voices come down through the years, speaking of long hours, lack of status, and judgments by employers about dress, entertainment, and other choices made during time off. Few people born in Canada wanted the work, so it became an immigration issue, a political issue. Although women were not able to vote during much of this time period, the wives of constituents and the wives of members of parliament put pressure on their husbands. One member of parliament was heard to say that nothing he could do would please his constituents as much as obtaining maids for their wives. In all of these policy discussions, the relative status and merit of people from different countries was taken as a given. Also, I can't help but be aware that the 1870s and 1880s were the years when many Indian residential schools were being built. Young Indigenous women in these schools were trained as domestic servants. This adds an additional layer to the horror of the federal government's decision to fund Indian residential schools. They were training Indigenous women to do work that they knew white women were refusing to do because of poor working conditions. Coming forward in time, Nalini Mouton's 2021 survey of racism in Canada's temporary foreign, foreign worker program shows that the impact of the intersection of race, gender, and immigration policy is still very much with us today, whether in the poor working conditions of migrant workers or the downward mobility of caregivers who are mostly female people with brown skin. Although we pride ourselves on making opportunities available for everyone, it is clear that there are policies and attitudes that impact people unevenly. When we think of rest as a component of work, rather than as something that comes after work, it matters that we pay attention to who is doing the work, the conditions in which the work is being done, and who is getting to rest. No one should be left behind. 
Last year in the meaning making service, I spoke about AI, artificial intelligence. AI is changing the working conditions for many people, most of them younger than the average age of people in our UU congregations. So the issue is perhaps less noticeable unless you're acquainted with the job struggles of folks in their 20s and 30s. The ability, that, the ability of AI to shift to schedule shifts and perform supervisory functions, admittedly in a very minimal way, is eliminating entry-level management positions. AI is also allowing the gig economy to move into more spheres of work. How do you hang on to your sense of self-worth when your income is precarious? When some people get vacation time and you do not? How do you take time away from work when your income depends on responding immediately to every digital message? When your movement through the workplace is tracked by AI, do you feel comfortable or even able to go to the bathroom? Now, I'm not saying all AI is bad, far from it. I think it can be put to good use in so many fields, business, government, healthcare, the arts, environmental sustainability, but I do think we need to pay close attention to the culture we are creating, especially the working conditions and who is impacted by them. Who is most affected by exhaustion and urgency? Who is served by this exhaustion? What interests are served by our inability to be present because we are tired? Our third and final reading this morning is from an interview with scholars, activists, and authors, Leanne Simpson and Robin Maynard. They were interviewed after they released their correspondence as the book Rehearsals for Living. Here is Simpson speaking about the individual and the communal. She says, I'm most interested in systems thinking and critique. If one only has their own lived experience, not only is it isolating, but it's difficult to see the logics that order that experience. I wonder about a focus on individuals. It is not individuals that will change things. It is movements and formations. Colonialism has been very good at breaking life down into individuals and then prescribing how we will relate to each other in order to reproduce the hierarchies needed to replicate capitalism and colonialism. End of reading. Simpson and Maynard are interested in our ability to create the conditions for a new way of living within our existing lives. The book is called Rehearsals for Living because each day we get another opportunity to rehearse how we want to live, how we want to be together. We may practice on our own, but a rehearsal is something we do together. Hersey calls this process liberation. Drawing on the work of womanist theologian Emily Towns, she notes that freedom is an experience of a moment in time. Liberation is an ongoing process. The power for change, the power for liberation is in the community, in the process. And we are best able to live into that process when we are rested, grounded, safe enough, and not distracted. It's not just driving that is poorly done when distracted. This is the call for us as Canadian Unitarian Universalists. When we put rest first in the list of meaning-making services, I felt the reaction in my gut. It felt wrong or vulnerable. This makes sense to me now. There is both internal and external resistance to resting. My role is to resist that pull of urgency and to prioritize rest, not just for me, but for those around me, those I am with, and for my larger community and communities. I have more success at this when we are all doing it together in community, supporting each other, uplifting rest and renewal in all its forms, whether it is taking a pause in the meeting or making space for rest in community gatherings. Prioritizing and practicing rest in community gives me the strength to bring it into other areas of my life. I am still not a nap person, but napping is only one form of rest. Napping is about creating a place that is safe and cozy and addressing experiences of disconnection, 
loneliness, abandonment, abandonment, and exhaustion. We can do these things in many ways. Knitting can be rest. Knitting has been found to lower blood pressure and relieve pain by releasing serotonin. Coloring can be rest. Going paddling or hiking can be a form of rest. Sitting with a poem and letting our mind float free in the image can be a form of rest. It matters that we know where our internal sense of urgency comes from and how this fits into the structures that hold us back. But the healing itself doesn't come from the analysis. We know enough. Healing comes from saying that we are good enough as we are and giving our minds, bodies, spirits what they truly need not feeding ourselves on the addictive hamster wheel of urgency. Repetition is important for our brains, so I will say this several times. I am worthy of rest, even if it makes me uncomfortable. You are worthy of rest, whatever feelings it brings up for you. We are worthy of rest. All beings are worthy of rest. I am worthy of rest. You are worthy of rest. All beings are worthy of rest. We are worthy of rest. Amen. Blessed be. Now let's try it ourselves, right now, just for a moment. I invite you into a few moments of shared silence following these words. If it is comfortable to close your eyes, do so. You might hold your hands over your eyes, as Trisha Hersey's grandmother, Aura, used to do. If it is more comfortable for you to keep your eyes open, then do so. You might consider lowering your eyes so you are looking at the floor or your lap or the seat in front of you. If that works for you, you know your body. Do what you need to do to slow into the silence. Rest in the imagery of this poem by the late Scottish poet, Kenneth White or call to mind an experience of your own. A High Blue Day on Scalpe by Kenneth White. This is the summit of contemplation and no art can touch it. Blue, so blue, the far out archipelago and the sea shimmering, shimmering. No art can touch it. The mind can only try to become attuned to it, to become quiet and space itself out, to become open and still, unworlded, knowing itself in the diamond country, in the ultimate unlettered light.
This is the summit of contemplation and no art can touch it. The mind can only try to become attuned to it. And I'll invite you to come back into this space in this moment. And we'll sing again, be ours a religion. It's very short, so we're going to listen to it once and sing it twice. <laughs> Bill and Jen will now read our closing words. Just wait a moment, please, till we can see you. Part. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you. You can go ahead, Bill. Our closing words are by Eric Hepburn. We extinguish this flame to remind us. Love is the center. As we explore and rest, engage and heal. Love remains the center. When all we can see is cold ashes. Love remains. Thank you.